So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's some interviews, yours. Yes. Don't take them. No, I just didn't know the song from the previous session. Okay. And, and them. Um, so, welcome to session two. My name is Kathy Flynn. Um, I'm a volunteer at the Lawrence History Center and very proud of the symposiums that we have put together over the years because they're just they're immense. It just brings so much knowledge to the community and about the community. And today's is really a, a nice presentation, a nice gathering of um, different aspects of public health. And Dr. Ho talked so much about the broad concept of public health. Um, so we're pleased to bring all of these presentations um, to you. And what I'd like to do is ask each of the presenters to give a quick introduction in terms of who they are and, and what they're interested in. And uh, then what we'll do is we'll go into the presentations, 20 minutes each, and then we'll have time for question and answer. So that will be terrific if we get going. So, Sabina. Yeah. And I, I will mention that um, Sabina is, is presenting from the point of view of, of policy and how policy informs what, what occurs in terms of public health. Uh, so it's a, a grand start, and you can give a brief biography, and then I'll ask Pat Chassane to introduce herself, and then our present, present is from Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. So hi. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Savannah Gillis. I am a senior at Antwerp School, and I worked on this project for my um, my independent project for my senior year. Um, so wrapping up senior year, and then we go to college in the fall. Great. Thank you. And thank you. And one of the thrills that I'd love to see is, is um, academic work from all levels of academia. So, Savannah, thanks. And Pat. Hi, I'm Pat Chassane. Um, I am, uh, I was former director of the Lawrence History Center, and I have worked in uh, uh, Lawrence on various things, including the uh, Merrimack College Urban Resource Institute um, for many years. Um, and right now, I'm retired from those positions, and I'm working on the history of Lawrence in general. Uh, public health has been an important part of that, um, and my husband and I have worked together on, on that in Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. And then Wendy Power and Keith. Hi, I'm Wendy Barr. I'm the residency director at the Lawrence Family Medicine Residency at the Greater Lawrence Family Health Center. Um, I'm actually a graduate of the program. That's how I got to Lawrence. This actually I matched here for residency back in 1999. Um, left, came back. Uh, but uh, we're going to be talking about our program and how it was formed. And I'm going to introduce our the faculty. I'm Keith Noakes. I'm uh, also a family physician at Greater Lawrence and one on the faculty where I um, run our uh, medical student education programs, among some other things that I do there. Um, I've been at the Health Center 17 years, right, since 2001, which actually makes me the newbie out of these, this group. Um, so, <laughs> um, and it's so combined, I think we've got a pretty good sense of history of the Health Center, but we're going to talk a little bit about in the residency and we'll talk about it. So I'm Carol Marshall, I'm a family doctor and an associate program director, and I've been at Lake since 2020 as well, but I have six months on key. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not a race. <laughs> so thank you. So not to cut into our time anymore, we'll proceed with Savannah and her presentation. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, so for my presentation today, I kind of looked at a more historical perspective on Lawrence as well as the flow epidemic and how kind of public health and housing and um, epidemics can kind of intertwine. So my presentation is past the control law and housing impact assessment on the health of Lawrence. Um, so just kind of like an agenda of what I'm going to go through. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about Spanish flu 1918 and kind of the impacts of that both nationwide and more localized here in Lawrence and Merrimack Valley. And then also we have the relationship between urbanization um, at the beginning of the 20th century and how that ended up 
and the factors of public health, as well as the history of housing conditions and urbanization in New Orleans, and how that contributed to the spread of COVID-19. And I'll go a little bit into housing in the city today. Um, so just some context for the Spanish flu in um, So the flu came at the same time as World War I, so it can be kind of hard to pinpoint the um, amount of casualties and casualty rate just because it's hard to tell whether people died from the flu or other kind of um, casualties before, but it's estimated that anywhere from 20 to 100 million people worldwide died from the 1918 flu, and 670,000 of those were in the U.S. Um, just a little fun fact, we killed more people in about a year, a year and a half than the Black Plague did in an entire century. So it's definitely one of the most catastrophic illnesses that the world has ever seen. Um, there's a lot of kind of debate about where the flu started, especially in the U.S., um, but a lot of historians kind of analyze that the flu was first seen in this kind of random town called Haskell, Kansas, and um, the doctor there noticed this kind of new type of illness he had never seen before. Um, it was identified as influenza, and a lot of the men that lived in Haskell ended up um, joining the military because this was during the time of World War One, so they were traveling around to different military bases and it does basically how the illness was spread kind of through soldiers traveling both throughout the state of Kansas and then kind of up the coastline as they were stationed in different places and that's um, said to be how the flu traveled both into the northeast and then into Boston and eventually into Florence. So some signs of the flu. Um, the 1918 flu, the symptoms of it were pretty similar to what we would see as symptoms of the flu today. So like you have fever, pain in your head, eyes, ears, back, feelings of soreness, vomiting, slow pulse. It's kind of pretty common and related to the flu that any of you might get today. But um, the kind of the reason why this was so impactful on the population is that this flu um, significantly weakened the immune system. So it was similar to kind of like a what you would see is negative and autoimmune disorder. So people would get the flu, their immune systems would be weakened, and then they would eventually get something like pneumonia or another bacterial infection. They would actually end up dying from that secondary infection, which is kind of why this flu was so fatal. Um, and one of the scary parts was that um, if you got the flu at this time, you would kind of have it for two to three days, and then you would recover. And if you didn't recover in that time, it was pretty likely that you were going to die from it. Um, and on a lighter note, this image to the right uh, is from a patriotic draft against the flu, it's from 1918, and it says, eat more onions, one of the best preventatives for influenza. So people had really no idea how to prevent themselves from getting the flu. Um, in today's day and age, I would just suggest getting the flu shot. But um, another interesting thing about this flu is the specific death rate. So um, this flu disproportionately impacted kind of what we would see now to get the healthy, um, like healthy age range or people who um, tend to be less susceptible to illnesses were actually more susceptible during this time. So if you look at this graph, um, ages like people ages five to about 35 were actually had the highest rate of death from this illness, which made it really scary because normally you would expect people like the elderly or people with um, weaker immune systems to fall ill, but it was actually quite the opposite. And then just to look at the impact of the flu on American cities specifically. Um, during this time, the U.S. was becoming um, very much an urbanized nation and um, kind of the center of the industry because of the Industrial Revolution. So if you look here in, like, let's say 1870, only about 20% of the U.S. population lived in urban areas. And then when you look forward to around when the flu um, kind of came around in 1920, almost more than half of people lived in urban areas. So this kind of fostered a, a culture of people going where the jobs were, going where the infrastructure was, and that was mostly in northeastern cities. But the problem with that is that kind of the growth of cities couldn't really keep up with the growth of the population, and so that just fostered widespread overcrowding. And another kind of, another thing that impacted this was um, the widespread growth of immigration. So if you look at this graph over here from um, the late 1800s to about 1920 when um, there was quotas put on U.S. immigration, there was a huge influx in immigrants from Europe to the U.S. Um, because the country was so prosperous. So the combination of these two things kind of just fostered this um, really surge in population that the U.S. really could really keep up with. So this is why the flu and overcrowding had um, kind of a very intertwining relationship. So this is a statement from the Public Health Service and talks about how um, we really recommend that in order to avoid the flu, that people avoid overcrowding. Um, and this was something that was super difficult in American cities. It was super, it was easier said than done. 
Um, they recommend the value of fresh air and things like that, but Zinc this time were very blue, they were very crowded, so this was kind of difficult to attain, and we'll see that um, specifically more in schools that um, So basically, the flu of 1918 kind of struck this time of transition, and um, the influence of the pandemic's impacts to the Leon Lawrence, which we'll get into a little bit later, kind of um, except, and, uh, exemplifies the coexistence of public health and housing, and how housing can kind of affect um, whether or not you live a healthy life. So Lawrence in the early 20th century, um, so just for some context, Lawrence was founded in the mid-1800s and it was built on seven square miles of land and it was kind of built to be this robust industrial city and that was definitely achieved by the early 1900s. And by the early 1900s, about half of residents were immigrants and they were foreign born, so this kind of contributed to this kind of immigrant city that um, Bill here talked about a lot. Um, one of the documents that I examined specifically in my research is this report on the Lawrence Survey. It was a report that was commissioned by um, this organization called the White Fund, which was kind of like a, a nonprofit at the time. And um, this group was commissioned by the city government to investigate housing and sanitary conditions within um, many of the tenement buildings where people were living, um, but no workers were living during this time in the city. Um, and right from the start, this quote kind of implies that they knew that what they were looking at was definitely something that um, that was a problem, that the housing system in the city was a problem. And so I'll get into that So, like I said, most people in Lawrence, most working class people in Lawrence in this 1910 1920 era lived in tenements, which were basically just apartments that um, were that were basically built for the working class, for the people that um, lived in the mills and they worked in the mills and they were often very overcrowded and not really built up to very good standards. Um, and something that did really help this was at this time in 1911 when the report was commissioned, about um, one third of the city's residents were living on one thirteenth of the city's area, so in a pretty concentrated space. Um, and this was in the central district of the city. And there was a population density per square acre of about 200, even upwards to about 600 people per square acre. So I had kind of a lot of trouble visualizing what an acre looks like, and I was told that it's about three quarters of the ball field. So if you can picture up to 500 people living in that space, it's just basically creating an environment where disease is meant to prosper. Um, and most of these tenements were about five rooms, and they housed anywhere from 10 to 18 people, which is, to me, is just madness. Um, so if you look at this chart right here, this is a bunch of different streets in the city, and then how many apartments were in each block. So if you look at, there's numbers like 102 apartments right on Valley Street to 89 to 77. So they're basically just cramming in people wherever possible. Um, and then housing throughout the years kind of got progressively worse. Um, so if you look at this from 1906, this was a house that had three apartments in it, and you can see it's three stories, it's about two stories wide. And if you go all the way back to 1911, um, that's, that house that's meant for the same amount of people gets one story shorter and gets like skinnier. So they're basically just trying to cram people in um, however possible, and there's really no building guidelines that are just followed. Um, another problem that the surveyors kind of ran into when they were investigating housing was problems with light and ventilation. So um, if you'll notice in a lot of mill buildings around the city, they have these big, large windows. And that's because um, builders were kind of figuring out that um, light had a positive effect on people's um, productivity and the way they worked. So that's why those mills were built with these big windows, just to kind of increase people's like mental health. But houses weren't really built to the same standard. Um, and in 342 rooms that the surveyors examined, it was impossible to read except the two, um, the foot or two of the window. And 59 of the rooms that they examined had no windows to the outside at all. So we all know now that light has light, and the amount of light you get into your room really does have an effect on the mind and the body. So um, these people just were not, did not have a great standard of living because of the way these buildings were built. Um, and then oftentimes when people did have windows, the houses and the tenements were so close together that balconies and porches would kind of block in those windows. So this image is from 1911, it's from the survey, and it shows that balcony in the middle is basically like on the neighbor's window. So even if you did have a window to the outside, sometimes you couldn't even see out of it. Um, and then sanitation was probably one of the most concerning aspects of the survey, at least when I was reading it. 
um, the surveyors said that they were astounded by the amount of people that were just living in dirt. Um, people lived communally, so often multiple families would live in um, one apartment, and this forced families to kind of like store their extra belongings and their extra food in their bedrooms where they were sleeping, so that was definitely not anything that was sanitary. And then hallways and, and outside of buildings, um, they were kind of just raw with trash, ashes, no one's really conditioned to take care of them. Um, and bathrooms were located kind of a community dorm style in the hallways and um, they were continually leaking and often sewage was dumped directly into the Merrimack River. So there was no, really no sanitation guidelines, no sanitation standards for the way that these people were living. And, um, this just kind of created this environment of both crowding and a lack of cleanliness that once the food did come around in 1918, um, it was pretty much impossible to put, to put a lid on any of this. Um, so one of the concepts that the surveyors talked about in their survey is this thing called triangular dispensation, which I think is cool because, because you can kind of apply it to today. So they talked about how these three groups um, basically had no incentive to improve the living conditions in the city. Um, in the case of builders, builders were pretty much focused on like the monetary value of the places they were building. They were focused on um, kind of making like making the most money that they could and leaving. And then in terms of city government, um, the city was so prosperous and profitable at this time that, again, there was really no reason to regulate housing in that regard either. And in the case of the tenants, um, many tenants uh, spoke English as a second language or didn't speak English at all, many of them were immigrants. So it was kind of hard for them to voice their concerns or voice their reason just because they weren't really listened to. And if um, they did complain, a lot of times they would just be kicked out of their building, so there was no reason to um, kind of bring up any faults of that. Um, so the, this report was kind of designed to produce some sort of legislation, but if you look back in history, um, there was really no change in housing policy at this time was made, that was made, but um, once the flu came around in 1918, conditions were pretty much the same, if not worse, and this, um, this is why the flu did hit Lawrence so hard and why the city, it took such a toll on the city is because of this housing policy. So when the flu did come to Lawrence, um, so it said that the first patient to come down from the flu in Lawrence was in September of 1918, and it was a man who actually resided in a tent and boarding house, and um, he came down from the flu and kind of spread outwards from there. And then I thought it was interesting that the city kind of thought it in their best interest to close a lot of the public spaces in the, in the city, um, but this was kind of counterintuitive because they were trying to get people to avoid crowds, but by forcing people to kind of stay in or crowded homes, this almost made the illness worse. Um, and by the end of the fall season of the flu, Lawrence had almost 5,000 cases and about 450 deaths from the flu, which was a very disproportionate um, outcome compared to other cities and other states across the country. Um, another interesting thing that I looked at was the Influenza Journal, and it was a journal that reported um, people's Doc, so doctors would go around to people's homes and kind of investigate their condition if they had the flu. And the interesting about the journal is that often people's names weren't even reported and um, they would just be called things like Syrian fellow or Polish man. This kind of proves that the flu was so, that so many people had it and it was so hard to document that doctors didn't really even take much care to document the people that were coming down with it. Um, so the reason, in conclusion, the reason that Lawrence was disproportionately impacted by the flu was can be directly correlated with the living conditions and the policy for the lack of policy in the city at this time. And um, as I was researching this project, as, as I was kind of finishing up, I came across this article in the Eagle Tribune that talked about um, this building, the Bay State Building in Lawrence. Um, that is an apartment building, and as I was reading it, a lot of the sentiments that were expressed in the article basically brought me back to the research that I was looking at from over 100 years ago. So people living in this building are describing their conditions as a nightmare, they're describing kind of the lack of care they receive from, um, from their management and from the people that are kind of supposed to be taking care of the building, and um, their complaints aren't really being listened to, and kind of to tie that back to what was happening in 1911 and in 1918. Um, so this kind of echoes the same sentiments of the problem with tenement housing. While this may not be a tenement, it could be considered a moderate version of one. Um, it's really important to realize that housing and public health do have such a correlation, and that if anything like the 1918 flu epidemic was to come about again, that this could be, again, a major problem in the city. So lastly, I picked this quote from the report on the Lawrence survey, because I think it can be 
can really resonate no matter what time period you're looking at. So it says, bad housing is not a question of averages and majorities. The majority of the housing is safe being excellent, and the minority so exceeding and deficient as to be a creative peril to the current welfare of the community. So this kind of proves that you're only as strong as your weakest link, and it's super important to kind of take care of the community as a whole and definitely focus on housing as a facet of health, um, as Dr. Cohn was saying this morning. So, um, through this research, I kind of I figured out that, that that housing and public health have such a strong connection, and it's important to pay attention to both of them. Sources, including the history center. Yeah. But um, nice, a nice Wait. job and a nice presentation. One point I mentioned that Savannah um, had in terms of the slides, in terms of her presentation, was the um, the um, the Lawrence survey by the White Fund, and we have a copy of that at the Lawrence History table. So when you go into the main hall, when we go back to lunch, directly to your left, as soon as you go in, this table with some. Um, items from the Lawrence Public Library as well as Lawrence History Center, and there's a three ring white binder that has the full copy of the Lawrence survey. That's also available online as a Google, Google document, sorry. Um, and it's fascinating, and it's just crammed with information that um, was so vital then, but as Savannah is showing us, so vital to today's conditions. So thank you. Again. Thank you. And I'll introduce now Pat Jusane, Dr. Pat Jusane. And um, Pat has done, over the, the years, she has done so much research on Lawrence, but she has really, um, for today, put together a presentation focusing on some of the very bright mind, minds that attack several different public health issues. And these were residents of Lawrence, and they certainly, they added to the, um, the health of the community reverberating over and over and over through the years. So you're in good hands with that. Okay. Um, I'll start by um, uh, kind of repeating um, Mike Sweeney's um, uh, comments at the end of his talk um, that to remember is to honor. And that really is the sense of, of, of this talk. He's, um, there are two people, two figures in Lawrence history who are not generally recognized. One is more than the other. Um, but similarly, you know, uh, we don't, in public health, uh, we don't have monuments. Uh, there are there very often people who um, work under the radar. And the two figures I'm going to be talking about are Hiram Mills, uh, who is certainly internationally known, and uh, Susan Crocker, who is far less known. Uh, what's interesting is that they share the same lifespan. They were both born in 1836. They both died in 1922. Um, and the main focus is their work in the um, last third of the 19th century.
the principle behind the smokestacks was that uh, um, they would, the emissions would not affect the local community. Um, that um, if the, basically the you know, uh, emissions would be out of sight, out of mind. Uh, we know now, of course, that the, uh, um, that the emissions go other places and, and uh, pollute other other communities. He um, developed and he designed two octagonal stacks, one of which still exists under a, a, a maze of cell tower uh, equipment. The other, uh, a few years ago, was um, demolished down to the base. Um, we did manage to get, my husband managed to get photographs of um, the first one before it was demolished. And I'm not sure you can see clearly, but the, there's the um, um, obvious aesthetic, the aesthetic uh, quality of um, 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 it's octagonal partly because they were able to make it um, taller, um, but not in a circle, which would have been structurally less viable. Rerouting the spigot. Um, this was a, a big issue. Um, this it was. Um, commissioned by the Lawrence Board of Health saying that, uh, okay, what, what would go on is that the, if they could speed up the river flow, it would clean itself out within a mile. Okay, it was a theory that was uh, not, not worn out. Okay, so you can see here, that's the original route of the Spigot River. It was meandering, it was slow, um, uh, had lots of, lots of problems with doming and that sort of thing. And then you can see it in the next one, how they straighten it. Okay? Um, what happened was this didn't work. It did not reduce disease um, uh, within the area, uh, but it did cause flooding and cause flooding um, until, it still causes flooding, but up to the 90s, it was some serious flooding. Um, but the city did get 17 acres more of land. They were able to build more chemicals on it. Um, okay, this is one, one view of the straightened Spigot River. And of course, this is the outcome, the uh, flooding. This particular flooding occurred in 1987, when um, FEMA decided it was time to come in and um, demolish structures so that they could um, develop a safe floodplain. So it would not be destroying um, areas. Okay, so. This didn't work either, okay? <laughs> two, two early efforts by Hiram Mills. Okay, then there was the experiment station. Whole different story. Um, the, he based this, it, the experiment station, on the work of um, an MIT uh, faculty member named Sedgwick, who discovered a cluster of typhoid cases from a stream that emptied into the Merrimack River at Lowell. And um, based on that, he gathered together an interdisciplinary um, a group of, of scientists from, from MIT. This is important for public health because Public health is not a single discipline. It is numerous efforts by people with different points of view. Okay, you 
see this rather um, unimpressive ranch at the building. Uh, that was the experiment set in the center that uh, Hiram Mills designed and built. Um, this is located on the island on the other side of the canal um, where down near the river, um, but on property that the Hamill family later on, they had their machine shop there and later uh, Ferris Technology was there. There's nothing left of it now. But what's important here are the, there are eight of these pits. Okay, they, they all have different substances in them, uh, sometimes sand, sometimes different kinds of pebbles, different sizes of individual um, pebbles, um, and they would filter Merrimack River water through that. And then do experiments to determine what actually killed off the uh, bacteria. Okay, this is the inside of that building, the lab. And here are the interior, you can't read that, the interior storage tanks where they kept the water to do experiments on it. And here is the filter bed um, where they, um, once they established the waterworks, with the, with the filters. This, this is located, it still is located in a different form on Water Street in, uh, in Lawrence. Okay, and that's his um, yeah, page where he describes the, uh, the function. Okay, this shows, he did this in 19, he finished it in 1993. 1992-93, um, and you can see where, um, how far the um, uh, deaths go down. Now on this one, the um, it shows there was a 26 percent decline in total death rate. Not only not only uh, typhoid, but diphtheria and all of those um, other infectious diseases. Okay, and this this was called the mills reinke effect. Um, and this is what made him internationally famous. All over the world, people um, implementing this process uh, saw incredible um, Decrease, decreases in death rates. <coughs> Another thing, fairly minor, but um, he would develop stencils at the uh, Essex company so that people um, would beware of, of the hazards in the canal water. Um, uh, some of those stencils, original stencils, are still at um, the Lawrence History Center. The other person, Susan Elizabeth Wood Crocker, MD at a time when there weren't many women MDs. Um, this gives her family history and her professional training. It's, she is listed in the U.S. Census in, 19, in 1870 as um, a housekeeper and then became a doctor practicing in Lawrence by 1875. She was um, she was taught at the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary and actually practiced there among immigrants. She became um, the president of uh, the Ladies Union Charitable Society that had been trying for five years to develop a hospital uh, and unsuccessfully. She first um, herself took over the care of children with scarlet fever at an invalid 
hospital on Montgomery Street. But this is the first Lawrence General Hospital. It was um, built on uh, Methuen Street, part of Methuen and Jackson Street, where um, now there is the, the gardens for the senior center there. Okay, she developed a nursing training school, of which at the time there were not many. Uh, and to indicate her interest in public health, and health ventilation and, and bathing, Savannah talked about uh, the importance of fresh air. And she focused a lot on that and teaching that to the, um, the nurses. Uh, she was very critical of the uh, state of the nurses before then, um, uh, comparing them to uh, Sari Grant in, um, in Martin Chuzzlewitz, in Dickens' March, Martin Chuzzlewitz. Um, diseases of children, diseases of women, there is no evidence. My husband and I went through all of the birth certificates from the time she was practicing. Uh, there was not one birth that she attended. Okay, so it's interesting. Um, one thing she did do that was very interesting, I don't know if this seems like it doesn't follow, um, she brought in to train the nurses in proper nutrition. Fanny Farmer um, was known uh, as the first writer of a cookbook that used scientific principles. You know, the, the older people among us remember older people who, uh, you know, said, okay, a handful of flour, some sugar, everything. But she had absolute cups and teaspoons and everything, and there's an example of um, a recipe. She published on food poisoning, the medical profession, and the people prevention of disease. Okay, clear public health interest, being able to back off um, from from the acute care. Um, associations and memberships, Massachusetts Medical Society. Three years after women were allowed to join the medical society. Um, American Medical Association, American Medical for the Advancement of Science, and Professor of the Principles and Practice of Med um, Medicine in the College of Physicians and Sur Surgeons in Boston. The uh, 10 great public health achievements from the Health and Human Services, um, we have it's not clear. There's nothing specifically written about vaccination, but she probably did um, involve herself in vaccination. Both she and uh, Hiram Mills control of infectious diseases in their own way. Um, certainly did that. Safer and healthier foods. Her involvement by uh, Fanny Farmer, uh, oh, Fanny Farmer in this set. Uh, healthier mothers and babies. We, we saw the, um, her focus for the uh, nurses' training school on children, diseases of children and mothers. Um, and then down here, this is just the keys. Uh, fluoridation of drinking water, well, that hasn't come up. Um, but actually, actually, the person in the United States, anywhere, who discovered um, the use of fluoridation was Dr. Frederick McKay, who was a Laurentian. He graduated from Lawrence High School. Um, he went to Colorado to solve the problem of discoloration of teeth um, that he found out there. Um, and what he found was a solution, uh, a solution to the cavities that people other places were experiencing. That's just the keys. He, he was responsible for beginning the whole fluoridation process. Okay. Yeah, thank you.
surprised you. You brought in a third of the wrench. I know. Okay. <laughs> you, know. you did not achieve. No, you, you extrapolated there. That was a pro uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. So now we have the team from um, Greater Lawrence Family Health Center and discussing their model program in terms of um, family health residents. Yeah, we will back up here. I'll turn it off. Yeah. And um, if you folks are more, more comfortable standing or sitting together because you may be playing off one another in terms of conversation, I don't care. Okay. Whatever works for you, that's fine. And uh, this is just this is a contemporary example of the um, immense types of uh, public health initiatives that are happening within the city. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. So um, we introduced ourselves at the beginning. I'm going to keep so I'm going to start off. Um, I get to talk about the prehistory a little bit. Um, so that's us again. Um, so uh, between us, because this is sort of in the mists of time at the health center, we actually don't have much of an archive there. So we got to work out with the history center folks, I think. But we think this is the site of our first health center, um, uh, which is on Garden Street. Um, it is an old funeral home, and we still use it for some other stuff, or have used it for some other stuff more recently. Um, but uh, the community health center movement really, um, Dr. Coe sort of gave a little bit of background uh, mentioning Dr. Uh, Jack A. Jack Geiger, who was really a mover on the idea of community health centers, um, and started with Count Gibson, both of them were in Tufts at the time, um, started two health centers, I think it was 1965 or 66, um, one in South Boston and one in Mississippi. Um, and those really became the model for the community health center movement, which was then pushed forward by uh, Johnson and the Great Society programs, and so written into law at that point, at that time, um, not actually through sort of health, um, through health legislation as much as it was community development legislation at the time that really pushed forward the idea of community health centers, and community health centers were seen as um, uh, centers that would be based within a community that would come out of community-based organization that actually to qualify as a community health center, the board of directors of a health center has to be at least 51% patients, so majority patient board um, in terms of leadership of the health center. Um, and so the, there was this growing movement around this sort of late 60s into the 70s. Um, and Lawrence at the time um, you know, was going through some of the economic decline that we know as there was a change in terms of the economic base of the city. Um, there was you know significant poverty at the time and um, people who don't have money can't pay doctors very well, so um, what happened to the primary care physician base in Lawrence is sort of emptied out over that time. So in the 70s, um, there was really sort of a, a dearth of primary care within the city. Um, there was the Lawrence General Hospital, which was the primary place people would go to get care, um, but otherwise there wasn't really a whole lot. So uh, the Greater Lawrence Community Action Council and Lawrence General Hospital um, came together around that. Um, Apply for a planning grant for a community health center, um, which I think was um, uh, granted in 1979, and the health center opened its doors in 1980. So um, they did pretty amazing work to get that kind of turnaround and get something started. The first year that the health center opened, um, they saw 8,000 patient visits, um, which is a pretty small number in comparison to what we do today, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, but for that first, say, decade of the health center, um, they struggled to uh, grow, and they struggled to meet all of the needs of the community. Um, you know, there's actually a great YouTube video, which I'm not going to show, but if you look that up, you see Dr. Serena D, who just retired um, after 30 years at the health center, is on YouTube talking about the early days of the health center when she came in 88. So in 88, by that time, we had opened a second site and we had moved to our Park Street location, which is still an active health center site, um, has an old elementary school. Um, but at that time, she said there were six, there were six physicians um, at the health center. Um, they had about 3,000 patients. Um, you know, again, they weren't doing massive numbers of visits in terms of patient care. Um, they were doing everything. So this was kind of age of the giants as far as health centers, as the health center goes. So they were, you know, taking care of patients in that clinic. They were running back and forth to the hospital. Um, at the time, they didn't have enough capacity. She talks about the how prenatal patients, so 
there was no, almost no prenatal care essentially at the time. And women who were pregnant would get seen by a nurse who would come in from outside of the city, give them prenatal vitamins, and that was about as much as they got until they went to the hospital and had their baby. Um, and so they were really sort of um, did, struggling to sort of bring in doctors. And so at that time, uh, around then, there was a medical director who had this idea of starting a residency program. So residency programs are where uh, physicians are trained after med school in their specialty of choice. Um, and we, uh, at the time, the idea was, well, let's grow our own doctors because we're having a hard time bringing doctors into the city. Um, so let's create a program where we will train physicians to in Lawrence in the health center, which was actually a really revolutionary idea. Nobody had actually done that before. Um, and so they, um, we were what was the first what's called now teaching health centers. Um, and so there was a bunch of movement over that for that over the next several, couple of years, really. Um, they brought in a number of new physicians, um, and they were still kind of growing and changing and getting prepared um, for this transition to have training here in Lawrence. Um, so this is about where we were before, right before the health center opened the residency program. So we had moved up to about 15,000 patients. We had two clinical sites, um, plus a school-based health center had opened by that time, so definitely growing. We had a HIPSA score of over 20. So health, pro health provider shortage area scores are used by the federal government in terms of the main eligibility for programs um, of various kinds. The highest score is a 26. Higher is worse in terms of your uh, provider availability. Um, so we were pretty high up there. We had about 12 uh, doctors here, and health outcomes were something we were still struggling with at that point. So, okay. so uh, this is a picture actually of uh, the North site and the mural that was painted around that time. It's a beautiful mural still there today. Um, we actually do see some of that. So uh, Keith mentioned there was this idea, we had a medical director who said, you know what, I cannot get doctors to come to Lawrence, I can't get them to stay. When they come, they don't speak Spanish, they don't know how to treat our patient population. I think that's the other big thing about the health center is we really found it as an institution here in Lawrence to serve that new and growing Latino population that was growing in the 70s and in the 1980s. Um, and some of our founding, uh, actually our founding community medicine director talks about that it was the first community-based kind of um, institution that people of the Latino community could walk into and expect to be spoken to in Spanish, the signs were in Spanish, everyone was going to talk to in Spanish. So you needed the doctors to speak Spanish as well. Um, so normally how this would go in graduate medical education, that's the type, that's what residencies are, it's the education that happens after you finish medical school, is that it's all based in hospitals. Uh, in the 1960s, it grew um, by leaps and bounds because they tied it to Medicare. So Medicare pays hospitals to train doctors so that there are more doctors to take care of Medicare patients. Um, so that is how they, these, these programs were being funded uh, at this time in the 1990s. So the hospital again um, said, look, we really, you know, yes, the health center needs doctors because we really need to get patients out of our emergency room. Um, and we need doctors to work in our hospital. Uh, and so normally this would have then been a Lawrence Durham Hospital Family Medicine Residency Program. But the um, really revolutionary thing that happened was Joe McManus, the president of the hospital at the time, Glenn O'Grady, the medical director, said, let's get together, let's talk about this, and let's see what would be the best way to get doctors trained for the needs for our community. It would really be at the health center. So why don't we have the health center be the residency program? So in prior to this, there were residencies based at hospitals that trained family doctors in community health centers, but the hospitals still owned the residency. The residents were still employees of the hospital, which what the hospital would say what they do. Here, they're saying, let's have them all be at the health center. The hospital will pay, we'll get the money from Medicare, and we'll give you the money at the health center so that you can run the residency and do it the way you think is best. And we'll train the residents on their hospital-based pieces at the hospital, but the bulk of the training is going to be at the health center. And this was absolutely revolutionary. We, in the um, early 2000s, when we would go around and say that's how our funding works, we like people would in the residency world would be like, what? No, no, you can't do that. Um, but they did, <laughs> uh, which I think was very inter innovative. And the, again, the idea was is let's make it be about how do we make doctors with the skills to affect the health and not just the medical care 
of the Lawrence community. And this is actually a newspaper article from at the time when they were about to start the, um, the residency program. So this idea of let's grow our own really was around the mission. This is a very, you know, we're very focused idea. We're going to train family medicine doctors to meet the needs of Lawrence, communities like Lawrence throughout the world. Uh, so what, what did I say what doctors in Lawrence need to do? They need to speak Spanish. It's really hard to find enough doctors in medical school who already know Spanish to be able to work there. So they made the, this is again when it comes from the health center perspective, that we don't have a big interpreting department, thank you very much. We're going to train all of our doctors to speak Spanish when they arrive. You don't have to know a word, you can just come in here and we'll, treat, we'll teach you Spanish. Um, we also look around at our community. What are the types of services we need to make sure that a family physician serving Lawrence or a place like Lawrence need? Well, we talked about the fact that we, there was not adequate prenatal care in the community. We better know how to deliver babies. We better know, learn how to deliver babies and women who have a lot of medical problems because they can't get to Boston. So we need to have those services up here. HIV was a big issue at the time. We need to make sure that we're, able, we're training people who can take care of patients uh, with HIV or other emerging conditions and diseases. The homeless is a big issue. We want to make sure our, our doctors can work with the homeless, pediatric care, procedures. As things have developed, I will say like you know, in the 2000s, as the opiate, as we became a medical um, assisted therapy for opiate addiction, came to the medical office and sent it to the methadone clinic. We were one of the first programs to say, yep, that's now required too, because again, if you're going to work in Lawrence, you better be able to provide uh, buprenorphine in the office. So this is kind of the idea. So we get to a fast forward to today. Um, so again, we're a model that didn't really exist, and they just kind of created it because it met the needs of the community, really again, coming out of those community needs. And so uh, when the Affordable Care Act was being formed, they said, oh, great, we're going to get all these people health insurance, and we're going to send them all these community health centers. Oops, there's not any more doctors at the community health center. Who's going to see the patients? Oh, maybe part of this law, we should actually try to increase doctors to work at community health centers, which means we need to train more doctors to work at community health centers. They looked around the country and said, well, who's training doctors at community health centers? They said, well, one of the best ways to do that is to train them in community health centers. And they found us and said, hey, look at this. There's a community health center that's running their own residency program. What if we just paid community health centers directly to do that? And that became the idea of the teaching health center program. So today, there are over 600 teaching health center programs throughout the country. Um, and it was just reauthorized, thank goodness. Um, but in two, three years, please make sure to tell your local congressman to pass reauthorization of that bill. Um, one of the other things we've done in Lawrence locally is looking at how the medical training has changed and developed in the needs of our community, as we're now one of the national pilot four-year training programs. Family medicine generally is a three-year training process. We do it over four years here in Lawrence. Um, and that allows us to improve having our residents be really engaged in our community. If you were at the top right before this, you saw Julia Say, one of our third-year residents. She's been working on food insecurity. It's not generally one of those things you think that you're doing during your medical training um, time. So we really are able to do a lot of that and be able to improve our spectrum. The other thing that has happened over time is our residency program really has become nationally known in other ways. Our clinicians are getting awards about compassionate care. We are part of the culture of health team uh, that Barbara Johnson recognized. Um, our faculty are winning regional and national awards, and we actually are going to Congress and saying, you should do more of this in other communities because it works. Um, so how is Lawrence viewed around the world in the medical training community? Um, we actually have one of the, we're very, um, we have a very good reputation these days. Um, depending on how you think about it, you world report and those reputation surveys are based on the popularity contests. We're in the top 10 consistently for family medicine residencies. There's over 500 of them in the country. We get applicants from all over the country. So this map just looks at our applicants and our residents. Green are our current residents. We're getting trainees from all over the country and they stay. And then we're getting applicants again from all over the country. The grayed out states don't have medical schools. And then what happens when they graduate? So when they graduate, uh, oh, if you look, we have 175 graduates. Uh, in June, we'll be up to uh, 184. Um, we have 20% of them are, are currently working in Lawrence. Um, a third of our, our greater Lawrence clinicians today are graduates of our program. So we've been able to do that for your own. Over half of our graduates 
work in community health centers to just give you a national perspective on that. It's about a 10 to 15 percent nationally in primary care training programs. So you're definitely not but like the other. And 79 percent of our graduates are working in underserved communities. Again, nationally, that's less than 20 percent. And then, what has been the impact? If you look at Lawrence and healthcare access, because again, this is a we're looking at public health, we're really talking about the, the biggest thing we're doing is looking at healthcare access. So we talked about those HIPSA scores, it's a national way of looking at things. So these are the current, as of January 2018, health provider shortage uh, area scores for the community health centers outside of Boston. Um, that's just a cost I could deal with. Um, and really, I think it's comparative. Boston has you know, got medical schools and you can live in a really nice neighborhood and commute over to uh, to community health center. These are community health centers um, in more outlying city, small, small cities. Uh, so this is Lawrence, we're 10. If you look at that, no other number is the same or lower. So um, Lowell is at 14, Worcester is at 18, um, Brockton is at 11, I believe. I can't remember the slides from here, but it's there, there are, everything's higher. And so what's not what's if you think about Lawrence normally is you know Lawrence is worse than the other gateway cities, not in the case of healthcare access. We've actually done the job of being able to improve healthcare access to the point that my graduates, if they're gonna get um, scholarships from National Health Service Corps, I have to export them to other Massachusetts community health centers. They go to Lynn, they go to the Cape, uh, they go to Worcester. So now Dr. Marsh is gonna talk about what the health, what the impact on the health center has been.
have a centering parenting program that is uh, group visits for taking care of women who are pregnant, building a support structure, and building on the, the, the skills and resources that women themselves have to, to be able to teach each other how they are receiving prenatal care. That's expanding into child, child care after the babies are born to improve skills. We take care of high risk pregnant patients, so women that have diabetes, that have hypertension, that have um, other medical um, disorders that may complicate their pregnancy are able to, be, able to be taken care of in, their, in the health center in lines with providers who speak um, Transgender care is also something that a, a graduate from our program started a program where now we have dozens of patients in Lawrence who are receiving um, hormone therapy and um, are um, being cared for and within the health center not having to go down to the so some of the things that we've been, been able to impact since those early days, um, you heard the um, discussion about women who were unable to access pre um, prenatal care. That does not happen now. It's extremely rare for someone to come into the hospital not having any you know, notebook care, and there's usually really complicated circumstances. We were able to impact um, rates of childhood lead poisoning. Um, before the health center started, it was a relatively, relatively regular thing for children to be hospitalized in large jail for treatment for lead poisoning. That does not occur. We're hoping to be able to have some of that same sort of impact in the areas of addiction and in areas of social determinants of health. Um, as health providers, we're learning more and more that the majority of people's health and the things that impact that, it's really difficult to impact within the walls of the health center, providing prescriptions. Things like housing, education, access to food, and access to places to exercise have more impact on people's health than a prescription that I So we are working to identify people who have um, needs in those areas of social determinants of health, to partner with community organizations that are working in those areas to be able to impact people's health in the most broad sense possible. And we're training our, um, our physicians in training to be able to go around the country and do that same thing. I think I'm going Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, that's it. It's an immense amount of impact that you made and globally on this. So I think it's regional and nationally. I'm not. <laughs> thank you, seriously. Um, if um, Pat and Savannah wouldn't mind coming to the front. We have until the call up for a question and answer. Uh, a little discussion, or uh, however, you know, whatever anyone might want to bring up. I know there's one one question earlier about um, with people living, they're members of the, the program living. And that's where they are they living mostly. Um, about half live in the city of Lawrence or right around Lawrence. Um, a half uh, towards Boston. I, I would say when you're recruiting people um, in, a lot of people are partnered, and so their partners are their jobs are in Boston, and it's way easier to reverse commute it than it is to ask the partner to commute down to Boston every day. Um, so that's usually the driver. Those that don't have the partner restrictions, most of them do live in Lawrence for some or all of the residents. Just to follow up, should you find that they to live in Lawrence and stay in Lawrence? I don't think where they live impacts if they stay or not. We have a lot of people who live in Boston who are staying. Um, they just keep doing that reverse commute because they love the community and they feel really engaged in that part of the community. But you know, I definitely think it makes it easier while they're residents to be more engaged at you know public meetings. I think I'll tell you it's not the best place ever. That's a plug, right? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the doctors who come here that don't have the uh, Spanish language skills and how do they get to be converse, a conversational and you know, whatever they're going yep. on? Uh, so, is that a what, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, so we, we've been presenting about this passionately a lot for the last couple of years because that is the question people have. So um, we've been tracking this with data for about 10 years when we rebooted our curriculum. Um, so about 30% of the residents coming in have pretty good Spanish when they come in. Um, and 97% of the residents graduate with proficient Spanish on a standardized uh, uh, oral test, basically, that's used by Kaiser Permanente to decide if doctors can see patients without the temper. 
um, so we're using like pretty high standardized you know, pieces. We spend a lot of time in the first year on spin. They spend 10 days before they ever see a patient uh, at the Rossi program on the North End, which is 100 hours of Spanish instruction over 10 days. Lovingly called Spanish Bootcamp. Mm -hmm. um, we have a Spanish instructor who's worked with us for over 20 years who does one-on-one -on -one sessions with our residents. Um, the residents pay for. We also pay for them to do another um, intensive Spanish course, uh, usually at an international uh, school, sometime during their first year. Um, and then they're just immersed. I mean, when you're speaking Spanish every day with patients, you know, it's, there's an immersion piece here. Actually, Keith runs a medical student immersion rotation where students come up from Tufts to get an immersive Spanish experience. If you've explained where the doctors are coming from in their different communities and where they live. Where do the 60,000 patients come? Because they can't all come from Lawrence. So how big is our is your outreach? Is that like up to Haverhill, to Methuen, to? It's mostly Lawrence, but it is Haverhill. It is some of greater. It's you know it's definitely the greater Lawrence area. But I mean we are the primary care clinicians for uh, over half of the city of Lawrence. Over half the city is rural. Yeah, I should have paid more attention to your map. But where's the next healthcare center? Um, so we already opened in Methuen and yes. hopefully we'll be in April soon. Because April doesn't have any health center. But the closest one is not us. Um, it depends yeah. which direction you go, but, but Lowell. Uh, Lowell would be Lowell the next one closest. Lowell has one. So out of that 60,000, do you know, we're still bringing in some folk from Methuen and April? Yeah, yeah particularly April because they don't have a table. But they, they, they actually have huge needs. Are the centers we're all one, one organization. This is the greater Lawrence. Yes. Yep. So, Diane, you have a question? Um, I have a question for Pat. Um, given the three issues that you mentioned, Hiram Mills, I'm a fan of Hiram Mills too, because I figure you did more to keep my ancestors alive <laughs> than anybody else in the first years of the, I mean, well, the turn of the century. <clears throat> And I was just wondering how my mother survived the flu when she was two years old. But anyway, how did he switch from that structural engineering focus to the, this experiment station research on the, just because of that encounter with the MIT um, individual? Well, the title is Threats Free Solution. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think what went on with him is he was working on the Hoosick Tunnel and other things like that, it's you know, all structural. Um, but the need in Lawrence was, he was affiliated with MIT, he was aware of the various people looking at disease and the possibility of prevention. Um, and he just went into that. And, and he knew that as a structural engineer, he couldn't do it by himself, but he knew what had to be done. He knew who to bring in. Um, and that's what he did. He did a lot of other things, too, with um, uh, prevention of public health, tuberculosis, and stuff like that. But these are the three things. And it shows his evolution. Smokestacks, certainly, from our point of view, <laughs> didn't work at all. The rerouting of the spigot was almost as bad. I mean, it says in the Dictionary of, um, of American Biography that uh, he, he was skeptical about the, um, you know, this change in the river flow. Um, but he did it. And whether that was pressure from the city or what, we don't know. But then there was the experiment station and he could reach and the top tag you mentioned is the what about the Pacific? The Pacific, Pacific is the one that was demolished oh. down at the base. It can, you know, you come out Franklin Street to uh, Canal Street, and it's right there. You so the, the one that survives? The one that survived is the one that's near a cell tower. Near Broadway? No, it's no. Uh, right near. By the Central Bridge the, there. Yeah, the Casey Bridge. Yeah. Right near there, it was the lower Pacific Mill. So the, 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 the one at the upper Pacific Mill was built in 1873. The, uh, Is that the one that was near Broadway? 
Yes. And that's down now? Yes. Because oh. I had by chance the opportunity to be in that mill. And the base of that is was like from that wall to here. Yeah. It is the photographs don't show the immensity of it, but the engineering in it is just it took you breath away to look at it. Right. Pat. Um it's interesting that Hiram Mills builds the experiment station at the end of the city. And I know we are putting a lot of toxins into our water, so it makes sense that he wants to see it. But a lot of toxins are coming in from Bowl and Manchester also. Well, at that time. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, then. So when do we build our first, when he discovers it's through the sand and the coal that you filter the water, when do we build our, and where do we build our first filtration beds? Is that where they are today up on Water Street? Well, yes, but there's very much change. Um, yeah. But yes. But that's the site. Is that the site? That's the site. Um, it was uh, 1891 that he completed the filter bed. There, yeah. Um, we have one other question here. Sure, Colin, thanks, Pat, for making that. I'm the city councilor of Lawrence, and the issue you brought up back 100 years ago, we're facing still today, so thank you, you're really touching on that. I was intrigued, Pat, by the uh, straightening of the uh, Shawshank, on the Sacred River, excuse me. Can you, can you tell me just a little bit more about were people displaced at that particular time that that was happening, and do you have any more details of how did they do it? Was it good? What was going on back then? At that, at that time, um, the population wasn't nearly as as much as it became after. Okay, I told I, I mentioned the 17 acres it added. Well, that was 17 acres that wound up being devoted to tenants, uh, primarily. Um, the but it wasn't populated to the extent that it was later. Yeah, because at that time the population within the city was around the core of textile manufacturing areas like that down really yeah. Like downtown here. I mean, so, so, so the outer regions had to be very as as we look at them now. By when, any means. when you talk about the, uh, the strike and where people came from, they actually came from that area. They were they were going to the mills until they were on the strike. But it, it was really around the rerouting of the space where these these buildings, you know, nobody had codes, nobody did, you know, we paid any attention to safety, ventilation, anything like that. So we have time for one more question, if there is. Is that a water room? Go to the first. Um, I was just wondering, uh, did the flooding create uh, more health problems? Uh, no, the flooding. Not that we know of. I mean, it did. It certainly caused displacement, um, and in that sense, yes, there, there were health problems. But uh, it wasn't as if there were identifiable diseases, infectious diseases that came um, as a result of the flood. So, uh, thank you, everyone. One of my presenters um, for all of the knowledge that you what, put together and really worked on and you know, spread to young people and those of you who are here attended. Um, I hope you do go back with some really interesting information um, and carry through and just know there's more programs, there are, you know, there, there are types of decisions, policy making decisions that are being made now that will have an impact a hundred years from now. And you know, knowing that some of the bright young people that we have in the city now, like Pat was talking about Harry Mills and Susan Parker, we have bright young people who are making impacts. It's all ties together. And that's why we love history, right? That's a pleasure.